welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Agata Radkowska Parka, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth Brahma Talks webinar sponsored by Brahma Grodzka Teatrenen from Lublin. I'm sure most of you are familiar with our organization, which is a municipal cultural center dedicated to the memory of Lublin Jews. If you wish to learn more about us, I recommend that you watch our first Brahma Talks, which you can find on YouTube, where Vitek Dombrowski, Deputy Director of Brahma Grodzka, speaks about our history and mission, as well as his own. Before I introduce our today's program, a few technical details regarding our format. Uh, we are going to have around 45 minutes of discussion, followed by 15 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. If you are viewing us from the webinar room in Click Meeting, uh, please ask a question using the Q&A tab which should be on the lower right corner of your screen, just next to the chat tab. Uh, you can ask your questions anytime, uh, but please note that we will try to answer them at the end of the meeting. I also very much encourage you to use chat to say hi. Uh, if you are viewing us live on YouTube, you are also free to ask questions on the YouTube chat. Uh, and now it's uh, time to introduce our guests. Uh, today I have the pleasure to welcome a friend of mine, Lioratek, uh, whom I believe many of you know and have seen her in Brahma Talks before as a host. Uh, today Liora, a team member of uh, Brahma Talks and a special project partner to uh, Brahma Grodzka Teatre Nen, is our featured guest. Uh, and I have the pleasure to welcome in, and to introduce you to uh, Dvora Trachtenberg, uh, who will run the conversation with uh, Liora today. Uh, Dr. Dvora Trachtenberg is a retired psychologist and a descendant of Lubliners. Uh, as part of her professional career, uh, she has worked with those directly affected by the legacy of Holocaust that have uh, included children of survivors, children of rescuers and children of perpetrators of the Shah. Dvora's parents were born in Lublin and survived World War II by fleeing to the Soviet Union. Uh, she was born in post-war Poland and emigrated with her family while still a child. Dvora, thank you very much for accepting our uh, invitation to run this conversation with uh, Liora today about her recent project, the Neshama Project, Conversation with Poles, Rescuing Jewish Memory. Um, okay. Agata, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just got a message from someone that said there's a problem with the audio. I don't know if it's just for that one person or... Um, if you can let us know on the, the chat if everything is fine with the sound and the view, I would be very grateful. Oh, it it's... seems it's fine. Seems it's fine. Okay. Sorry. Okay, guys, go ahead. Okay. Do you want... Okay. So... Uh, my name is Dvora Trachtenberg, and I would like to welcome you all to this talk. I am delighted and honored to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to talk with Leora Tech about her wonderful and inspiring project called the Neshama Project, Conversations with Poles Rescuing Jewish Memory. Leora's project seems to be a true labor of love. It is also one that no doubt will make a substantial contribution as it enriches and at, time, at times challenges our understanding of both the Jewish and non-Jewish Polish experience and sometimes the complicated relationship that has existed between Jewish and non-Jewish Poles. And Last but not least, the project itself can play a significant role in, contribu in contributing, to use Leora's own phrase, to the healing of historical wounds. Leora, of course, will be able to speak with us about her project much more eloquently than I can. But here is a very brief introduction. The Neshama project consists 
of the creation of a video archive of interviews. Interviews conducted by Leora herself all over Poland with primarily non-Jewish Poles. The people she interviews have dedicated themselves to uncovering, to rescuing, and to the honoring of the memory of the once vital and diverse Jewish communities and individual Jewish lives in Poland. Communities and lives that until World War II played a vital role in the then heterogeneous fabric of Poland. Leora, no doubt, is familiar to many of you and needs no introduction. For those who may be relatively new to these talks and perhaps to the work of Brama Grodzka, and maybe to those uh, who have just joined us, um, let me say a few words of introduction. Leora is the daughter of, of Nechama Tech, a Lublin Holocaust survivor, and later a Holocaust scholar, whose wartime survival as a young girl can largely be attributed to the kindness, the empathy, and courage shown to their Jewish neighbors by some non-Jewish Poles. Now, Leora's own work has strongly focused on issues relevant to the rescuing of Jewish memory in Poland. In addition to creating the Neshama Project, Leora is the founder and director of Bridge to Poland, an organization that focuses on memory, on commemoration, and on identity, as these relate to Jewish history in Poland. She is the American ambassador to Brama Grodzka, with whom she collaborated on this Neshama project. And she serves on the board of the American Association for Polish Jewish Studies. Leora, the author of many articles, has spoken to audiences in the United States and abroad. Now, the Neshama Project, just for your information, has its own website. For those of you who have not had a chance to visit it, I highly recommend listening to these very rich interviews. The site can be accessed at neshamaproject.org. I don't want to take up much more time except to say that Leora will first say a few words. We'll then view a video trailer showing snippets of some of the interviews she has already conducted. And then Leora and I will have a conversation about the project. We'll leave time for a question and answer period. But any questions that we may not be able to answer during our time together will be replied to privately and individually afterwards. So without further ado, it is my very great pleasure to give over the so to speak mic to Leora Tech. Thank you so much, Dvora. Um, I, I wanna say just before we watch the introductory video that it's such a pleasure to be having this conversation with you for those that don't know, and that's probably almost everyone, <laughs> Laura and I have a, a really amazing connection, which I just discovered after the first Brahma Talks. Um, and that is that she is the niece of my mother's beloved teacher, Hella Trachtenberg, whose nickname was Chuchka. Um, and my grandfather employed her to teach my mother and my aunt during the war. And it was such an amazing pleasure and surprise to discover Dvora and find out that she was related to Chuchka. Chuchka, unfortunately, was, was murdered in Lublin during the war. But my mother um, uses her kind of as a moral compass um, in her life. So that's a great connection. So yeah, I think um, there's no need to say much more. This is an introductory video to the project, gives you a chance to get a sense of, there are actually nine people in it, and then on the other side, we'll, we'll talk. Many non-Jews engaged in the rescue of Jewish memory in Poland knew nothing about Jewish history in Poland when they were growing up. 
Ja dorastałem w latach 70. i 80. I, i nie przypominam sobie, żeby rodzice mówili o Żydach. W szkole też się nie uczyłem o Żydach. To w ogóle była taka kwestia, której, o, o której się nie mówiło. The Jewish memory was like excluded from my perception of the reality. My parents, uh, they are learning from us now. Because as you know, they were grow growing up in this communist time in Poland when the Jewish, Jewish subject was like a taboo. But at some point, they discovered what was missing and were compelled to act. To byli ludzie, którzy byli skazani najpierw na zagładę, a potem na zapomnienie powojenne. To było uderzające, to mnie uderzyło. Dlaczego? Zacząłem się pytać, dlaczego tak się stało, że osoby, które, że ludzie, którzy mieszkali tutaj tyle lat, 800 lat, ponad 800 lat, nagle są skazani na zapomnienie i byłem ciekawy, e, dlaczego? Zaczęła się zupełnie nowa sytuacja dla mnie. Osoby, która zaczęła powoli odkrywać to, że w tym mieście e, żyli Żydzi i że ich polscy sąsiedzi zapomnieli o nich. I to było coś takiego głęboko, czułem się głęboko nie w porządku tej, w tej sytuacji, że dorosły człowiek nie, mieszkający w tym mieście nic nie wie o, o, o Żydach. Właśnie uznałem, że to, że to jest coś nie, nie, nie tak w tej sytuacji. Uh, what happens in the Holocaust it's quite simple. There are victims, there should be memory. And I feel that I need to commemorate the Jewish citizens. I say yeah, for me this is the patriotic action because what I am doing, we are commemorating the citizens of this country which I represent. It is these dedicated souls who by honoring the Jewish community that was erased from their land give us hope for the future of humanity. I grown up with the awareness of duty to care about the roots, to care about the history, to care about the family and the people who has no one to care about the families in the ground. Myślę, że najważniejszą rzeczą jest to, że ludzie, mieszkańcy zrozumieli, że to jest że ich, ich kultura, że Żydzi i Polacy żyli obok siebie, obok siebie że 50 na 50 czyli połowa na połowa mieszkańców było tych i tych i oni razem ze sobą współpracowali, żyli, a więc nie możemy uciekać od tej historii, powinniśmy ją cały czas kultywować i przekazywać potem. If we would like to see some light somewhere in the future, it's possible just only when we will treat each other as people as human being. I understand that when we try to teach people in Poland, we say, ah, yeah, because I teach you about Jewish culture. I teach you, I tell you something about Jewish cemetery. I will tell you something about Jewish uh, uh, history uh, in Poland. Of course, but you cannot forget that in the first place, I am telling you about people. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Are you able to? Yeah, so that, thank you, Leora, and thank you for the trailer. And now that we've seen the trailer and we've had a little bit of an introduction to who these people are, why don't we start off by talking a little bit about them, um, about these memory rescue workers in Poland. Many of them say in your interviews that when they were young, grow in their youth, they knew nothing or next to nothing about Jews or about Jewish communities in Poland. And yet here in your interviews, we meet them as adults who are, uh, whose commitment to their work is truly striking. Now, and many of them even say that they don't consider this work, they consider this life, that they don't differentiate between the two. I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit, since you've spent time with them, about 
what may have been some of the catalysts that propelled them on this road, on this journey of, re of reclaiming Jewish memory, uh, what drove them to engage in this work, and also what continues to drive them. I wonder if you can say a few words about that. Um, thank you, Dvorah. Several of the people, or maybe more than several, that I spoke to talked about discovering an absence. You know, um, for example, uh, Darius Popula, who's from Nova Sanche, you know, he said he was about 20 years old and he read um, a memoir. Um, I don't remember, I don't know if he remembers from where, but about Jews in Poland. And then he wanted to find out, well, what about my city? You know, wh how many how many Jews were there before the war in Nova Sanche? And then he finds out that it was something like one third of the population. And yet there were no monuments. There was there were no plaques. There was no memory. Um, and so in his words, he said, I felt like I had to act. You know, mm -hmm. I had to do something. And you saw Tomek Pietrushevich in the video talking about, you know, realizing that there was something wrong with an adult man living in the city and knowing nothing about, you know, what had been, for those of you that are familiar with Lublin, you know, Brahma Grotska is actually this gate, right? And on the other side, you know, on, on one side of it was the Jewish town and that there's a lot of empty space there now. There's a parking lot, there's grass, you know, and like it used to be this thriving Jewish community. Um, so people like put it in different terms. I one of one of the most poetic forms of talking about this absence, I think, is um, something that Rafał Kowalski from the a museum of Mazovian Jews in Płock said, and he talked about it like being a phantom limb. You know, you have this, you don't have this limb anymore, and yet you still feel pain there. You know, and I thought that was a really beautiful way to put it. Um, sometimes, you know, Tomek Sibulski from Krakow, he talked about how he was a teenager and he was um, working at the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw for the summer. And then he discovered that, you know, there's this symbolic grave to Janusz Korczak. And he was like, he, the way he put it was, what is my Janusz Korczak doing in the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw? Because this is a, an, you know, children's book author, among many other things, doctor, head of the orphanage, you know, all kinds of things. But but he wrote these children's books that Polish children know, but Tomek didn't know he was Jewish. And then he discovered there were other people that he didn't know were Jewish, other writers, Julian Tuvim, Polish patriots. And yet when he went back home and started to talk about that with the adults in his life, he sensed this reticence, you know, they didn't really want to talk about it. It's like this uncomfortable, um, and I think that was probably already in the mid nineties because he was born in 1980, if I remember correctly. Um, so um, he said that propelled him forward because as a teenager, there's nothing more enticing than a taboo, right? You want to immediately go there where, where you're not supposed to go. Um, you know, and there are other motivations like, um, Zbyszek Nosowski in Otwoc, which is an important place for me because it's one of the places where my mother was saved during the war. For him, it's from his Catholic faith. Like he um, said that, you know, the church, um, you know, asks of Catholics to reconcile with Jews, you know, so there are, there are diff different reasons, mm -hmm. but that idea of absence, I think, is very common. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was also struck by so, so how some of your interviewees uh, referred to their own Polish patriotism as something that drives them, that they felt uh, the responsibility as Polish citizens to, um, um, you know, to, to, to uncover uh, the heritage of the Jewish community that was also part of their own heritage. 
yeah. but the two are, are, are inseparably intertwined, really, in Poland. Yes, this idea, and I, I'm not sure who the first person to say this was, sorry, but, um, you know, the idea that you can't tell the history of Poland without Jewish history, and you can't tell the history of the Jews without Polish history, and again to to quote um, Dariusz Popula, because he's a he's an athlete, he's an Olympic athlete, and he says, you know, I wear the eagle on my chest, and I'm representing this country, and so this is a patriotic act when I'm doing. And I went with him when he was talking to students in a school, and it was like they were, it was like he was the Pied Piper. I don't know if you all know that. <laughs> but like the children follow this guy around and it was like he would be here with a group of children and then he would go here and whoosh, like a swarm of bees all the children would follow him he he started off talking about his you know his kayaking and uh, uh, um sports and stuff and then he like morphed into his work on jewish memory so that was really cool yeah fascinating that's Really fascinating. So, Leora, uh, many in our audience will be familiar with the work of Brahma Grotzka in Lublin, but um, perhaps people will also want to know, like in what other parts of Poland is this memory rescue work taking place? Could you just say, yeah, yeah could you I just say something perhaps about how many people you've interviewed so far and how extensive this work is? Yes, yeah, so funny you should ask that because we have this map prepared that Agata made. Um, so the blue uh, markers on this map are the places where I've already gone. And they're not, you know, there are a lot of places where I did multiple interviews, like of course Lublin and Lublin, Krakow, Warsaw, you know, they're like a bunch in those places. Um, and the red ones are some of the next places that that I hope to go. Um, you know, I, I want to continue this project. Uh, so now there are um, there are 43, I've done 43 interviews. And um, three of them had two people in them, you know, so yeah. Yeah, no, that's that. That's, uh, that's wonderful. And um, We'll look forward to the ones you haven't done yet. Me too. <laughs> so, um, Leora, like my sense is, and also this comes up uh, in, in the interviews you've done uh, with the people who do the memory rescue work in Poland, is that this sort of work can be sometimes difficult. That at times it's carried out with little support, financial or otherwise, and sometimes it, it's even met with scorn or opposition. Can you just share with us a little bit about some of the challenges that these memory rescue workers may face in doing their work? Perhaps what sort of reactions they may receive from Polish society and what sort of reactions uh, do they receive from the wider Jewish diaspora? And by diaspora, I'm also including Israeli Jews. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, so um, the one that sticks out in my mind um, when you ask about a negative experience is um, Krzysztof Chubashek, who is remembering the Jews of Wukuf. He um, describes in his interview like real opposition from the mayor there. <laughs> Um, and this is in contrast to other people that have these great working relationships, you know, in their towns. Um, and he found an old shtibo, like an old prayer house, and it was in really dilapidated condition. But he thought, you know, we could kind of um, renovate this place. And it was very small, but maybe just make it into a little center to, dedicated to Jewish memory. And then the um, mayor... I don't know how many of you know this word dafka, but like sort of on purpose, like dafka bulldozed that place and put a parking lot there. You know, to me, that's like the most extreme. That's like such an extreme example, you know. Um, 
And yet he persists. <laughs> he has done so many different projects about the Jews of Wukuf, you know? So it's like, I feel like, um, oh, Irenus um, Socha also described to me from Dembitsa opposition um, from the city hall. You know, I'm sure there are others that aren't coming to mind, but um, when you asked about the reaction from the Jewish diaspora, um, <laughs> For, for some of the people that I interviewed, I feel like the relationships with descendants uh, uh, from their places were really, really important. Not, not that there were other people that said, eh, who cares or something like that, but for some people, they really, really emphasized it. Like um, they talked about being part of those people's families and how you know the, the relationship goes beyond just the stories from the war. It's like they are now in each other's lives. And I mean, I can attest to that in terms of my friends at Bramogrotska. It's not like we're always talking about um, the Jews of Lublin. You know, we, we, we know things about each other and, and we care about each other as friends. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I believe you mentioned that you've also sent the, the uh, video the link um, the website link to the people you've interviewed or perhaps individual interviews out to them. So I'm wondering what kind of um, responses have you received from, pe from the people you've interviewed? Um, how have they reacted to your project and either their own interviews or to the host of interviews? Um very positively you know i haven't uh um besides like spelling some things wrong on the website and having to correct them <laughs> and I'm, a, I'm sorry about that um yeah i mean people have been really positive and i've gotten you know other responses from people that are not um part of the archive you know that are really intrigued and you know um and I, what's gratify, what was gratifying and surprising to me was that I think four people have said to me they want to use this material in teaching. And I, I hadn't even thought about that before. And, um, you know, I think two and no, three in Poland and one American guy who he lives in Israel, but he does programs for Americans and both on the college and high school level. So mm. that is so great because yeah. my goal is for people to know about these people because I am so inspired by them and like you said labor of love and I use that word on the website and it it really is a labor of love and I think I might have told you that whenever I watch one of these again I feel like <laughs> I fall in love with that person again I'm like oh you know like that's the most interesting amazing person and then I go to watch the next one and I feel the same way so it's so cool like I didn't anticipate how much having them all together in this website would feel like wow you know it's different than just having had the conversations you know so yeah, it's, a, it's a, as you said, it's rich and gratifying. Yeah, and it's exciting to me that students will be able to discover. And also, like, um, right now, I think there are only four Polish interviews on there, but there are a lot more in Polish on the pipeline, in the pipeline. So Polish students will have materials to access. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I have this goal of translating everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So, Leora, that, that's, I mean, there's so much more to say about everything that's come up, really, you know. It's like, I think I, I said to you, e each one of these thoughts and issues and so on deserves almost uh, a meeting, a presentation, uh, you know, all, all on its own. But um, I'm wondering, can you share with us something now a little bit about your own personal journey with all of this? Um, often when, you, when you've interviewed people, uh, you've asked them to describe their journeys, often from perhaps their youth, uh, where they knew very little about uh, the Jewish experience in Poland, to where they are now. And each time you ask a question of that sort, uh, 
I couldn't help but think that you yourself engaged in your own uh, personal, your own meaningful journey, a journey of discovery, of greater understanding, or, 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 or something that, that was extremely meaningful to you. Can you tell us a little bit, can you share with us a little bit about your journey in this? Yeah, so I think a lot of people on this call or webinar um, saw the first Brahma Talks with Vitek Dombrovsky, who introduced Brahma Grotska. And Vitek and I, um, we, we, we kind of have this parallel life thing because we were born in the same year. And early on in our friendship, he said to me, if, if there hadn't been a war, we would have been friends, you know? Um, and we are even friends, but we would have grown up as friends. And um, we talk about, Vitek and I do this joint presentation performance thing, or we did do it before the pandemic. And, um, you know, there's a similarity in that he didn't know about the Jewish history in his own country growing up. And he had to discover it like, you know, mm -hmm. as a, grown person and it I really didn't the only thing I knew about Poland was what had happened to the Jews you know um, I didn't think when I was growing up or when I was in college or something I didn't think that there were these Polish people on this land that also had an experience and maybe not a hundred percent of their experiences had to do with Jews you know um, yes. And that was like, I think one of the really big learnings for me is that this ability, and maybe you ha you can't be, you have to have a little bit of age, a little bit of wear on you <laughs> in order to be able to do this, but to hold these nuances and be like, you know, not compare suffering. You know, it's like um, we suffered, but if, if I acknowledge somebody else's suffering, it isn't taking away from my suffering. It's not this pie that has a limited number of pieces in it. Unfortunately, there's enough suffering to go around, right? And um, learning also about what the non-Jewish experience was during the war. And I try on my Bridge to Poland trips to really do a, you know, teach people that, like that there was, and I remember on one trip, a woman said, did the Polish people suffer? And I, I kind of like laughed, like, cause I was like, it was so obvious, you know? And I said, of course they suffered. And she said, well, it's not obvious to us. And then, you know, I remembered like, if I met a Polish person before, um, you know, before I actually went to Poland, I probably would have wondered, you know, what, you know, did you or your parents or your grandparents like, what was your relationship to Jews? Like, did you save Jews? Did you denounce Jews? Did you, you know, it, it, it was only in relation to Jews. So I feel like I was, I gained like a more nuanced, um, you know, way to hold history. And that's thanks to Brahma Grotska, you know, cause that was my first introduction in Poland. I actually came when my mother's memoir, Dry Tears, was translated into Polish, she invited me to go on the book tour with them. So, um, but I was quickly introduced to Brahma Grotska and it was like, wow, there's something amazing here. And for many years, I didn't know there was anybody else, you know, and I would, I created Bridge to Poland and I would bring groups and we would meet people at Brahma. And then over the years I learned, um, I went, I was on part of the seminar program through Polin from the Galicia Jewish Museum. And we met Karolina Piotr Yakovenko and Benjin. And, you know, so I started to learn, oh, there are more people and there are so many, you know, um, which is really great. Yes, well, I think, uh, I think you might have answered my next question. Let me just ask it in case you would like to add something to it. So. As a child of a Holocaust survivor who was helped by non-Jewish Poles, and as the daughter of a Holocaust scholar, we might all um, expect that you brought to this project, to uh, specifically to the Neshama project, uh, a wealth of knowledge, of familiarity, uh, a wealth of awareness of Holocaust-related issues. 
of the role of rescuer, bystander, witness, for example, perhaps issues relating to conscience, conscience and morality. So I'm wondering, while, while traveling around Poland and doing these interviews, were there things, and you've, you've touched on this already, but were there things that particularly uh, might have surprised you that maybe strongly struck you in some way and that, that perhaps challenged your own preconceptions? I definitely came with a lot of knowledge about rescue because my mother's um, field is rescue and resistance. Um, uh, gosh, that's a hard question. Um, I know I, I did, what came to my mind was just something else that I learned. Um, and I really learned it from Tomek Petrashevich at Bramagrotska mm -hmm. that to appreciate fragments, you know, that, that fragments are very valuable and we shouldn't just discard them that you often in the Holocaust context, you're not going to have a whole story, you know, with an arc and denouement and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, he, he has, the, there's a foundational story uh, from Brahma Grotska about um, a boy in the town of Kamyonka that his teacher saw being dragged to his death. And within five minutes, his hair turned white. Mm -hmm. Tomek remembered that story, but nobody else from his class remembered it. The teacher had died. And it wasn't even really a story. Like it was just, you know, a wisp of a mm -hmm. you know, person's life, this nameless, faceless child, right? And, um, but when he discovered that Brahma Grotska had been the dividing line between the Christian and Jewish worlds. And when he decided he was going to make this center dedicated to the Jews of Lublin, that story kind of now had a context for him. And he could have discarded it. You know, he could have said, how can I remember this boy? I don't know anything about him. And he instead he decided to embrace him. And it's to me like the most important part of the exhibit actually in Brahma Grotska because, um, that the story of that boy is is there and you know like physically you can touch this like plastic plaque that has the story and then you can i can tell the story and whoever's listening today can listen and it's a way of keeping the memory of this one child alive you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes thank you thank you for that you know, um, it is just a matter of fragments like like um, Kasia Vinyarska and Białowieża, like she she wanted to, um, you know, teach her students about Jewish memory in Białowieża, but she didn't know about it, and so she had to learn about it. So she started asking the old people, you know, and the old people really wanted to talk to her, and then she tried and tried to find survivors and she she was about to give a presentation of her amazing website about Białowieża, about the Jews, and like, I think a day or two before this guy that she had been trying to find in America, David Valsham, I think, I hope I didn't get that wrong, um, contacted her, or she connected with him. And for her, it, it's such a precious relationship. Do you know what I mean? And I don't remember how many Jews used to live in Białowieża, but like the number that she can be connected to is obviously much smaller than the number that there were. But whatever connection you have is so precious. Yes. yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the significance of the name you chose for the project? That is Neshoma? Yeah, so... And meaning or, or various meanings that may hold for you and your work and also for the work of the memory rescuers? Yeah, so first, um, I, was get, I was calling it the Rescuer of Memory Video Archive. And I was talking to my son, Liam, and he was like, seriously, like, don't you want to be a little aspirational? <laughs> um, so I was like, yeah, okay, I like to be aspirational, but like, what, what name can I give it? And he said, well, how do you say memory in Yiddish? And I was like, like Yisker, but there are Yisker books. And, you know, I don't want to do that, the Yisker project. And somehow in our conversation, we came to Neshoma, you know, I don't know. And it, it felt um really right because to me it means you know it's 
when I was little, um, you know, my 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 parents actually spoke Polish when they didn't want us to understand, but there were occasional Yiddish phrases. And one of them was good in neshoma. You know, if someone was a good person, they were a good neshoma. So it's like, I have that association with it. And I feel like these people doing this work, of course, they would not want hagiographies or anything. But, you know, <laughs> the work is important and the work is healing and, and good. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like they are good souls. And the, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say neshama means soul, you know, neshama <laughs> in Hebrew. Um, so this word soul also refers to the people that they're remembering, you know, these souls that didn't get, they, their lives were taken from them too soon, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it's all those generations that are before us. Yes, it has multiple, really multiple meanings. Yeah. yeah. So Leora, you touched on this before, and I'm not sure whether I should raise it again, but I was wondering, and uh, like, what hopes do you have for the Neshama Project, for the future of the Neshama Project? You said that you were contacted by a couple of people working in um, organizing trips and education and so on. So what are your hopes for the way people use this very rich archival material like um are you hoping maybe now that they've contacted you that perhaps educators um or educational institutions might, might use it as a resource um do people have permission to use these interviews in whole or in part um like what are your thoughts about this um so my first uh, impulse, which you can read more about on the website, um, it sort of came out of a conversation with um, the late historian, Robert Kowalik, who was an amazing person. Um, but I just had this idea that, you know, we have the USC Shaw project where, you know, Holocaust survivors' voices are remembered, but I felt this same impetus that it was necessary to preserve the voices of these people, that they are, in for me as the child of a Holocaust survivor, um, special and showing the good in humanity, which in these times of division is so important, I think. And I also think for future generations of people in Poland that are going to be doing memory work, it's going to be important to meet to be able to meet these people. They will not have the advantages of being able to really know survivors. They will not have the advantage of maybe coming from that, you know, taboo that that Karolina Yakovenko mentioned, that Tom, Tomek Zabulski talked about, you know, that and they won't have that as a driver, you know. Um, maybe they'll have other, you know, negative things as drivers and positive. Mm -hmm. As drivers, but so that was my real, you know, impetus. I want them to be archived, you know, and I want to catch them, you know, like Rafa Kowalski went all around the world interviewing. Oh, and I forgot, I keep forgetting I have these pictures. Um, this is Rafa. Um, he went all, all around the world interviewing survivors from Płock and he, he uses the, the title of Hannah Kral's book to outwit God, you know, to get there in time, like when, when there's still time. And obviously we have more time to talk to these people, but sometimes you don't realize how quickly time passes. So, you know, I think all of us can probably say, oh, I wish I had interviewed my grandmother or I wish, you know, my great aunt or whatever. So I guess I didn't want to end up on the other side of that saying, I wish I had done that. And I got the opportunity, thanks to Wellesley College Fellowship, um, to do this. Um, but like I said, I really want to translate, because right now, all of the clips are translated. Each person has a full length video and a clip. And all of the clips are translated, um, whether they're in English or Polish, and the full length Polish videos are translated. But I'd really like to translate also the full length English videos. I, I just, it's a question of money. I hate to be crass, but that, um, and, and also translate the whole website, you know, so that it's, cause I have all the bios and behind the scenes and stuff that's all in Polish and English, but I want it to be like, you click on a button P L or E N and you know, 
So, oh, sorry. And I want to interview a lot more people. I want to get to a hundred. Okay. So oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so Leora, I'm just looking at the time and, um, and, and registering the fact that we unfortunately have to move on. And I see that there are a couple of questions there. Um, but can I just ask, just before we go to the audience's questions, um, I, I would just like to hear maybe you, you say something about the importance of stories. Let me just backtrack. Uh, much of the memory rescue work focuses on individual lives, individual stories, on anecdotes, on, on specific places and lives. Can you say something about the importance to for us of hearing, of having these stories versus um, perhaps just reading um, reports or history books that report sweeping numbers, um, report data, um, you know, that describe events on a very massive scale, for example, and they could be catastrophic events. Yeah, first of all, I want to say that my definition of this term that I that I use, rescuer of memory, is very broad. So it's not only like grassroots um, memory workers or, you know, artists, it is them, <laughs> but it's also guides and scholars and teachers, you know, so um, yeah. lots of different ways. So maybe some scholars are doing a little bit more like working in the academic sphere. Um, Story is like hugely important. That's another thing I learned from Tomek Ketrashevich. Um, he's taught me a lot. Uh, so, you know, of course we all know, you know, um, you can, if you get to know someone like from another group, it's like, like better than just reading in general or something. Though I will say that I am perplexed by this idea that Sometimes when we encounter an exception to a stereotype that we have, it makes us change the stereotype. But for other people, it just makes them call that person an exception and keep the stereotype. And if you haven't seen the movie by Menachem Daum, Hiding and Seeking, that's like a great example of that with these two brothers. Yeah. But, um, that's kind of a digression. Yes, yeah, story is really, really important. And um, I heard I was on a webinar recently and a prominent person in Holocaust field said, I look forward to the day when we don't need Holocaust museums anymore. And I understand what he meant. Like, you know, we want a time when when there are no genocides and, you know, people use the Holocaust a lot of times to teach moral lessons. So he was looking forward to a time when we didn't need that. But I don't think there'll ever be a time when we don't need Holocaust museums, because for me, the story is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Like like all of my great aunts that, that I never got to meet, you know, the littlest thing that I know about them is, as I was talking about before, really precious. So yeah, story is definitely where it's at. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, that's that's so important. Um, I I have so many more questions, <laughs> and we could spend so much more time. Why don't I just read on the side of my screen here one or two questions that perhaps I can re then refer to you. So, um, Mary Tadier is asking, which I think you've already touched on, how many people have been involved in this project so far? Oh, but maybe she means in it. I talked about the interviewees, but there are a lot of parts that go into this. So there's, you know, I went around with um, a videographer, but sometimes a translator. Um, mm -hmm. or sometimes the person just had somebody translate, you know. Though, you know, I could understand more or less, but... um. And um, then we have like, the videos have to be edited. They have to be transcribed. Um, we have to have the subtitles done, the promo, you know, you saw the intro vi video and we had yeah. narration a and lot, everything. A lot of work, yeah. Yeah, so there are a lot of different, and the website had to be built and designed and, you know, so there, there are a lot of people involved and they're all, please take a look at the thank you page because they're all thanked. And that's important, yeah. 
Okay, so Alejandra del Rio says, oh, "Hola, <laughs> could you could you share with us what made you start this project?" Um, after I encountered Brahma Grotska, you know, as I said, for several years, a, a few years after that, getting to know Tomek and Vitek very well, I um, started Bridge to Poland, which is my organization. Um, that's about teaching about the Jewish history of Poland with a focus on um, the non-Jews who are preserving Jewish life. But for a long, and that was mostly through trips, but also workshops and talks and writing. Um, but for a long time, that meant pretty much Brahma Grotska, you know. Um, also the guides, you know, and the and the scholars and stuff that that we have on the trips. But um, uh, then I think Alejandra, it was when I discovered that there were other people um, that were doing this kind of work, I realized, wow, this is like a really huge phenomenon. And it was so heartwarming to me to discover that. And the people that I met are so amazing. Like, like even never mind the project, I feel so grateful as like that I got a chance to meet these amazing human beings, you know, and to know them. Um, last year, Brahma Grotska um, uh, hosted a conference for memory workers from all over Europe, and I got to co-chair that with my friend Dominika Mayuk, and that was another revelation because this was not only Poland and not only remembering Jews, but remembering like all victims of National Socialism. So, you know, Sinti and Roma and displaced persons and, you know, forced labor. And from all these different countries, I'm like, wow, this memory work is, you know, huge. Mm -hmm. So one last question um, that I guess, what time is it that we should cover, you know, fairly quickly. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Dan Oren is asking, isn't Neshama a way to honor your mother, Nechama, as well? You know, it's so funny because um, Krzysztof Chubashek just put a post on Facebook about this and he wrote um, Neshoma and then he wrote in parentheses um, in Hebrew Neshama and then it it translated it when it translated it to English. I mean, that was in Polish and when it translated to English, it changed Neshama to Nechama, which are two. <laughs> different words because neshama is soul and nechama is consolation so actually no i did i didn't think about the similar you know they are very similar well you know but but in thinking about like consolation is related a, what it, it could be related yeah yeah it's an related, interesting yeah. concept it's in, not, in, interesting it's, question yeah, well, of course, Dan Oren always asks interesting questions. <laughs> well, Leora, I mean, there, there are more questions. And I think we have a few more minutes if there's another question, because it's we have seven minutes. Um, yes, I also want to leave some time for Agata at the end. And yeah. um, let me see. She doesn't need seven minutes, I know. No, <laughs> no. no but I need a couple of minutes, too. Okay. But um, well, 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 uh, well I'll take it's not a it's not a question. It's a comment. So you can probably take a look at it. Um, um, you will have access to it, I think, afterwards as well. Um, I. Can I just say that um, I'm so grateful to you and to Agata and to everybody who was here. And if anyone, you know, has any questions, I know Agata put the website and my email at the top of the chat, and you can contact me directly through the email or through the contact form on the chat. And we, we also will see all the, if there's anything that you wrote in the chat, I'll see it later. Um, I probably wasn't able to see stuff during this meeting. Yeah, and you'll be able to reply to it, right? You'll be able to re yeah. reply to it individually. Yeah. So, Leora, thank you so much. Thank you for this very interesting 
thought-provoking, inspiring project and for sharing it and your thoughts with us today. I'm hoping that the others have found our talk and the trailer as interesting as I have found it. I want to also thank Agata for anchoring this talk and to Brahma Grodska for collaborating with you on this Neshama project. I also, while I have the opportunity, would like to take the would like to thank the Brahma Grodska people for all the other important work that you do. And as for people carrying out this memory rescue work all over Poland, I want to say that we are tremendously grateful that as Liora mentioned, we live in a time that's often viewed as divisive, polarizing, isolationist, where often there's a reluctance to empathize with other people's predicaments, a reluctance to help, to reach out. So it's comforting and most inspiring to know that this work of healing historical wounds is somehow taking place, to know that there are people engaged in work that honors the existence of a people, i.e. Jews, who were often historically seen as the other, as outsiders, as pariahs, to know that there are people engaged in honoring the once vibrant Jewish life in Poland. I would also like to thank the people doing this memory work. And I pick this up in your interviews with them for such warm welcomes, for, for their extent of such warm welcomes to Jewish Polish survivors of the Shoah and to their descendants and in a way embracing those of us who have such a long history in Poland and what I'd like to say is that we too embrace you back <laughs> yeah <laughs> despite the coronavirus this yeah virtually we embrace you right now and virtually Thank you also to the audience today. When I first saw the trailer that we've all seen, I couldn't wait to listen to the full time, uh, full length interviews. And when I did, I was not disappointed. In fact, I felt tremendously enriched by them. I'm hoping that all of you will have the opportunity to listen to these interviews. To, to see and to hear these interviews. Although I think in one case you, he you only hear, but it's a fantastic interview. So again, thank you so much, Leora, and thank you, Agata. And I will now, uh, put, I will now put us back to Agata, or Agata will put herself back on, <laughs> <laughs> since I don't know how to do this. <laughs> um. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, really. Thank you so much to both of you for this amazing uh, and inspiring conversation. Uh, Liora, I, I see how in, impressed you are by all these people you've mentioned today. Um, but I have to say we are all also very impressed by you uh, and your work on your tireless work on Polish-Jewish relations and reconciliation. Uh, it's it's great to have you among our friends. I think I can say it on behalf of everyone you, you interviewed. Uh, and thank you, Dvora, for making this uh, meeting so uh, deeply meaningful. Uh, this conversation is already available on YouTube. Uh, if you, you will soon get a link to it on your email. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity opportunity to invite you to the next Brahma Talks, which will take place on uh, December 9th, uh, when Teresa Klimovic, a member of the Brahma Grodzka team, will speak about the new Jewish cemetery in Lublin as a site of uh, commemoration. Uh, I also encourage you to send us your feedback about uh, today or generally about the, 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 the program, either by comment uh, uh, in a form that pops up at the end of the meeting or by email. Uh, you can also share your ideas for future talks uh, as uh, we are all in the end doing it uh, for you. Uh, so thanks again for attending. Um, and Riora, if you wanna say something for the end, feel free. I wanna say 
just thank you to you, Agatha, to you, Dvora. It was like, it was like, I feel like we are, our kin, you know, and to everybody who was here. And of course, especially to the wonderful souls that I interviewed. I, I'm, yeah, grateful beyond words. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you all too. Thank you. And see you soon, I hope.